feel so epic. <laughs> Videos are so powerful. Um, I, I love that when I, when I was watching that video, um, it reminded me, you know, Buddy's going to be preaching in Genesis this morning about purpose and, and, and God and him being our creator. At the last, I guess in the last month or so, I was able to go to the mountains. Um, and then last week, yeah, last week we're at the beach. And both times, I just, there were moments where I just was able to just stand and sort of take it all in and just, it's like, wow, I, I couldn't believe how much God has like created around us in this world for us to see and explore, just to sort of behold his glory. Um, I think we, sometimes I miss it just in the simple things, even taking a walk and trees and plants and flowers. But when you get those moments to see the mountains or a beach or whatever things in nature lift your heart, it just, it's a good reminder of the beauty that God has created for us to stir that wonder in our hearts for him. So let's sing this morning, all creatures of our God and King.
if you feel so prompted, do it. guys pray with me. God, we are grateful to be here this morning. Uh, we lift up these words as a thousand hallelujahs. God, there's no words that can completely express uh, just what you are worth and the worship you deserve. But we come this morning uh, just seeking to do that, to give you the honor and praise through our songs and through just the very uh, act of being here. God, we want to honor you and we want to learn from you. We want to uh, understand you more, love you more, and then be sent out of this place able to worship you throughout our week. So we are praying for that this morning. Uh, would you meet us here this morning? Help us 
Uh, just turn our hearts and our minds and our attention to you. Uh, we pray that you would get the praise for that, and that, again, we'd be able to worship you throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated for just a minute. Um, we are glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Um, just a few very short announcements um, to just kind of let you know what's happening around here. If you're newer to Allen Bible Church and you've never let us know who you are, we would love to get to know who you are. And so you can scan the QR code in the seat back in front of you sometime this morning. That's going to let us know who you are. We'd love to let you know. Um, there's a welcome desk out there. If you haven't stopped by and visit our welcome team, you can do that too. We've got a gift for you. can answer any questions that you have. But we're grateful that you're here to worship with us. Um, part of our act of worship, we say every week, especially to those who are part of our church family, is to give uh, just financially back to what God is doing um, here at Allen Bible Church and beyond our walls. And so you can do that, um, scanning a QR code or giving in the box there on the door by the doors on the way out. Um, but we just remind each other, part of our worship is not just singing and being here, but it also is just giving back to God. And so we remind each other of that. Um, really, two announcements. Um, Already happening has been our Wednesday night midweek ministries for women and students and kids, and those continue this week. Just want to enjoy, uh, invite you guys to come back and enjoy those. New, starting this week, is a five-week uh, men's study, starting on Wednesday night at 6.30, going through the book of Proverbs or some, some things in Proverbs. So men, we want to invite you to join in on that midweek time starting this Wednesday at 6.30. So lots of stuff happening on Wednesdays at 6.30 for a variety of, of different age groups and folks, and just would love to see you guys up here that Wednesday. Our First through fourth graders now are going to be dismissed back to their classrooms so they can enjoy um, learning back there. And I just invite you guys to stand back up and we'll continue to worship in song. I think this morning is a good example of it's always good to have a little reset or a little talk about worship. Um, it is perfectly okay. You have the freedom to have whatever posture you feel before the Lord, whether that's sitting or kneeling, standing, raising your hands. I know sometimes that feels odd for us to do um, in a setting if not many other people are doing it, but that is totally okay. If you sing out, um, like what happened in the last song, and then people start freaking out a little bit, um, <laughs> Some, I will probably continue the song and like join in with you. So like we are here to worship the Lord corporately as a body together. And there will be times where I make a mistake or we make a mistake. Um, but when you're singing, it's not a mistake, right? So let's have the freedom to like not feel constrained by whatever it is that we have experienced before in our past or how the normal flow goes or whatever that is, but let's remember that our core purpose in these moments where we have where we're singing is to express our affection, our praise, our glory and honor to God. Amen. And if you're troubled, heavy hearted, come to Jesus and find your peace. And if you're run down, empty handed, come to Jesus and find your strength.
counselor, prince of peace, author and maker of everything, defender, deliverer, king of kings. place with you or not, God, just the opportunity we have to, to give back something to you from our heart, from our lips. We thank you for that. We ask that you would help us today to, to remember our purpose, why we're here, why you've, you've got us here, where we are in our lives, the people around us. We pray, God, that you would help us to see with your eyes and to show up where you have us. So we thank you, Father, for today and, and all you've set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Eric, and worship team, and thank you guys. As he said, even adding notes that weren't in the rehearsal, that's important um, to do, and Eric, I always appreciate you um, saying, hey, this is why we gather together as a body, but we also gather with our bodies. Um, hopefully it's the real you and the real me that have met with the real God. also pray that in this series, that's what we, we will um, be confronted with, his presence and what we've just sung, who he is, not who we imagine him to be. Well, we live in um, quite <laughs> discouraging and disorienting days. We're not the first people to go through discouraging and disorienting days, but that doesn't lessen the fact that often, daily perhaps for many of us, we wake up 
discontent, discouraged, and particularly disoriented, causing us to question as we're walking out the door, what's, what's the point of this life? What's the point of my life? When we start a series today, and I'm going to give you the spoiler alert up front for today's message, you and I were made on purpose for a purpose. God made each of us as his image bearers, and he calls you and me to be fruitful and multiply. And in case I don't say it later, this is, yes, part of being fruitful to reproduce, putting other, populating other humans in the planet, but it's not just that. And so we can live into this call whether we have children or not. It's the idea of, of having a fruitful life. And so he calls us as his image bearers to be fruitful and multiply. And in this series, which is going to be four weeks, we're going to run through the filter of three callings. What does it look like to be a Christian? What is my calling? And really, there, there are three callings of, um, that we have. And we'll go through three callings, two commissions within God's one big story to answer one question. What does it look like to live into his purposes and calling in my life and in yours to flourish as his followers? The answer to that question will be formed and informed by the story that you and I are living in, whether we're conscious of it or not, whether you wake up thinking alertly about this, you and I live within an origin story that frames how we see the world and what we do in the world. Now, origin stories are pretty much the rage over the last decade or so because they're huge money makers. We have a movie about superheroes. Let's just say back in the day that one of the original ones, Batman. Well, but we grew up with Batman, so do we really care? But yeah, let's make a movie, Batman Begins. And now you have all the, the Marvel and the you know, et cetera. And they have origin stories. Why? Because we need to know about, you know, X, Y, and Z superhero. But there's also part of why those make money is because we're moved to go watch them. And part of why we're moved to go watch these origin story movies is that there's something deep within us that's drawn to know our origin story, to make sense of our lives, and to make something of our lives, questions that are common to all human beings. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Do I matter? Well, let's jump into our text, which is actually the origin story of the Bible. And we're going to jump into our text, um, which is what you shouldn't do in making a movie, unless you'll go back to it. But we're going to jump in a couple days into the story actually in day six in Genesis 1. Turn to Genesis 1 in your own copy of the Scriptures. They'll be on the screen, the section that we'll spend our time in. Genesis literally means beginnings. This is the beginning of the story. And again, we're on day six, so we're a few days into God's origin story. Now, the world doesn't revolve around you and me, but we can't help but go, who am I? Where did I come from? What's my origin? And it frames every day that you and I live our lives. So let's jump in verse 24. It'll be on the screens if you don't have a copy of God's word. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. God saw that it was good. Then God said, still same day, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, mankind, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Yes, creeping like spiders and if you get the heebie-jeebies, I just wanted to give you that for a second. Everything that now lost my place that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man or mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. God blessed them, the man and the woman. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's the verse of every fisherman and hunter, uh, fisher person and hunter person. Then God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be good. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky and everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. Verse 31, God stands back and he inspects his creation and he gives an evaluation. God saw, he beheld it, he took it in, what he had created. He saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This series is called Repurposed, Fruitful and Multiplying, and today is Repurposed Image Bearers. And we'll talk over several weeks, what does that look like? We're going to dip our toe into it today, we'll try to bathe in it, and then we'll come back and get some parts we didn't get yet on what it looks like to bear God's image because you and I were made on purpose for a purpose as image bearers and today it's to be fruitful and to multiply. Now what I want to begin with here is uh, notice it's RE colon purpose and there's a little compass in there. I talked about we live in disorienting days and we need to be reoriented often to, to remember who we are, whose we are and why we're here. That's why God made sure to preserve this, his word for us. But I want to talk about RE for just a second. Because instead of a double entendre, which means double meaning, and for those who don't speak Boisvarian French, um, (laughs) double entendre means double meaning. We're actually going to use this to play with it with a triple meaning. Really a a double meaning with a, a little little bonus added to it when you put the two words R-E or re and purpose together. First of all, R-E or re uh, is a prefix. Welcome to boring English class. It's a prefix that means again. It means go back and repeat. It's, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. Lather, rinse, repeat. Even repeat has, you must repeat it again. Re, it means do it again. Go back to it. Repeat it. The second way that you can use RE, and it's why I have the colon there, is in old school memos at the office, which for one, people don't go to offices anymore. They don't have paper anymore. But back in the day, you would have a a memo pad and it would say RE colon, and then whatever it is you wanted to talk to them about. Now, this is the subject line in your email. I don't think they say RE unless you reply, and then now RE stands for reply. But RE, what it means is, here's the subject I want to talk about. So, this is again, do it again, repeat, repeat. And here's the subject. We want to go back and repeat and see it have it repetition in our lives. We want to say the subject for these four weeks is purpose. You were made on purpose for a purpose. This is not a self-centered series. This is not about your, your you know, self-help. This is about a reorienting truth that we need to co- keep going back to again and again and again to remind ourselves who is the creator, who is the point and center and king of the universe, and who belongs to him and is made in his image. And so what does that look like if I image him in the workplace I'm gonna go to tomorrow, in the house I'm gonna go to this afternoon, with the neighbors that he's called me to love, and yet, boy, that person's prickly and that person's avoidable for sure, but I'm supposed to bear his image. What does that look like? And so the subject for this series is purpose, repurpose. So now we put them together for the third, And this 
This third one um, can be something I think that resonates uh, with a lot of us, that to be repurposed, because a lot of us, again, I said we wake up and we're struggling with, who am I? Does it make any difference that I'm in the world? That kind of idea. How can I make any meaningful difference? Or for some of us, we're like, well, I know that, but you don't realize the mess I've made of my life. Um, you, don't, uh, you don't know the, the opportunities that I've wasted. I'm, I'm irretrievable. I'm unusable. I, I just need to be discarded. And then some of us actually have felt purposeful lives, but are now a stage of life where you're like, for whatever reason, I find myself feeling more and more discardable, either because of age or you've sort of done your deal, but now you're kind of like pushed to the side. And you're like, <laughs> and, and so, you know, I'm past my prime. I've passed my time of usefulness. And now I'm discardable. And so that's my third meaning when you put a re and purpose together is to help us see whatever story that, um, that is your story that God is not done with you. Those of us who are like, well, you don't know how I've made a mess of it or we've not made a mess, we've just drifted. We've just become inert. We've just become glazed over and not really doing much but looking at a rectangle that glows. And we need to be repurposed. And for those who feel like, well, I'm pretty much discardable. I'm kind of done. I'm past my prime. God wants you to have the example of like from the Old Testament of Caleb, 85 years old. Give me that mountain. And if that's the stage you're in, God is not done with you. Wherever that is. And I want to give you an example of this third usage of repurpose that has meaning to those things. Um, it's the side table that we, if you've been to our house, um, we've got two couches like this, but you may not really notice it. But between those couches at that corner is a side table. And if you look at it, okay, it's not perfectly done. There's a little bit of this, the top, this, this little two by four is a little bit there and is a little skew, but it's stained. Well, I want to tell you the story of our side table. This was about 27 years ago. I had a friend who's one of the most brilliant, creative, and hilarious human beings on the planet. And he and I would always push each other, like, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. And he knew that at uh, the, the time I was in grad school, um, I lived in a, a pathetic, well, not pathetic, it, was, it wasn't an impressive house. And then I had almost no furniture, which made it look really <laughs> pathetic including even just like if I wanted to go in, I can't remember if I had a TV, into the living room, I didn't have any table to like put my Coke on. And he knew that I needed a side table. And I was like, you know, the man, I love those tables at Pottery Barn where like they look like they're these just old things that have, you know, um, that, that have kind of little cattywampus, but they've got a cool look to them, a dark stain, whatever. We're driving down the road in my friend's white truck which I'm gonna not tell you why that's funny. Um, I'm gonna stay away from that story. He and I are riding down, the store, uh, riding down the street and my friend Matt goes, oh buddy, no buddy, yes, look. And I was like, what? And we found, we saw this giant spool where either wire or cable is on. And he's like, that's your side table, man. Not only is he smart and brilliant, he also handy. So he helped me stain it. 27 years, still in our house, still looks cool, paid zero dollars for it. Pottery Barn didn't get my hundreds. But why do, you give, why do I give you that example? Because some of you might be past the prime of a certain thing, or you might have aged out of, well, that's kind of little kitty stuff or whatever, but maybe God wants to repurpose you. And maybe you were, you were you know, flying along and, and a big bump in the road, a big divot came a, a catastrophe, a failure, whatever. And you're like, well, I'm done. And he's like, God's like, no, I'm not done. I got a new season. I'm going to repurpose you. And often the people that minister to you the most in a certain area where you're like, nobody knows the trouble I see. And no, I could never, God could never use me. The person who was hurt or failed in that area, God often uses them right there in that pain point, in that 
pressure point in that disorientation in your life. And so repurposed, we want God to repurpose us, reorient us into his story. We want to go back again, and we want to hit the subject of God had intent and purpose in creation, and you're part of that. And then maybe God wants to repurpose you, wake you up out of your slumber and say, let's get after it. So let's talk about origin stories for just a minute more, and we'll look back at our passage. Now, I'm no scholar on this, but I heard enough uh, folks tell me about it. But if you think back to uh, Babylonian times when they were the power in the world, and you imagine a kid just, you know, they didn't have lights that we have, and they just walk out, and they're like, wow, and you talked about it. The stars. Look at those stars. You say, Mommy, Daddy, what are those? And they'll say, Well, let me tell you a story. And the story they would tell you, you probably had to read it in some English class, and you're like, I barely read it, and I looked at the Sparks notes or Cliffs notes, and I barely passed the test on it. It's called the Enuma Elish or Elish, okay? And it's discombobulated, and it's strange to us because there's all these gods and demigods, but basically it tells the story, and this is what a Babylonian parent would have told their kid. Well, let me tell you what those stars are. And what those stars are are part of uh, a goddess, named Tiamat, I believe it is, who got in a battle with Marduk, who was a demigod, and, and Marduk was kind of the, god, uh, the demigod of order, and Tiamat was kind of chaos. And so they went at it, and Marduk won that battle, and Marduk slayed Tiamat, and then Marduk filleted, because, by the way, I didn't tell you, she's a goddess, but she kind of looks like a fish, serpent, eel, something or other, sea creature. And he says, well, this looks like a good fillet. So he fillets Tiamat. And those stars are kind of the blood drops, if you will, that came from Tiamat. And then, well, what about this when we're walking on the ground? Well, that's actually the other half of Tiamat. And then um, where do we come from, Mom and Dad? Well, we're kind of the, the blood drops that rose up out of the ground, and we are creatures. Now, they have another story in Babylonian times, which is more Memphis, because it's about barbecue. I'm from Memphis, if you don't know my story. And that is that Marduk got around. He's again, remember, he's the god of order. And the gods, particularly in their mythology, kind of like in Greek and Roman, like we like our power, but we don't really want to be hassled with you humans. And we'd like to just, you know, enslave you or something. But, Mar but one of the things in the Babylonian gods, evidently, they love barbecue. They love the aroma of meats cooking. They're my kind of people. My kind of demigods, whatever they are. And Marduk said, hey, wait, we're sitting here taking all this time, you know, keeping the fire going, putting meat on it, getting more meat. We don't really care that much about eating it. We just like the aroma. Let's make some creatures and let's have them tend the barbecue for us. What that tells us is, and, and so then, therefore, the whole purpose of human beings that you would tell your little child is, we're basically here to tend the sacrifices to make sure the aroma is still pleasing to God so they don't get mad at us and squash us. And so you walk around on pins and needles and you pretty much are going, the only purpose of life is to avoid getting displeasing the gods and I'll just do my duty in kind of a robotic, enslaved way. And that's one origin story out there. And we think that is wacko. <laughs> a fish goddess and some gods having a barbecue and, and we think, man, that is, that's wacko. But that was the dominant power for centuries. And so therefore, that was the story that was lived there. Well, we live in an age where we are kind of part of the dominant power in the world that has our own stories about where did human beings come from? And what is, what's our purpose? And so while your neighbor and I, you know, your neighbor down the street, they may not believe the fish goddess thing and the blood seeping up and the blood making the stars and all that, but they do believe that the world came out of nothing, has no particular meaning, that life blew up, emerged simply as an accidental process, and it came kind of like the gods in Babylon out of competition and conflict. 
In fact, this is all about just surviving. And so Enuma Elish was about, out of violence and conflict, let's make some humans, because we need somebody to make the barbecue go. And in our day, we're created out of nothing, out of chance. Here's what our message that you don't realize we walk into, and your kids, my kids, are in the middle of and have no idea they're in the middle of it, is a story that basically says you are an accident. You are the residue of chance. In fact, this is all about, life is just all about competition and conflict, and you better just figure out how to survive. No wonder we're so depressed. No wonder we care about how many likes we have on a post. No matter, we'll throw any fellow employee under the bus so we can get the job. Well, I would submit to you, and you can show the next story here now. As we go through over these four weeks, I want to submit to you, we also have an incomplete Christian story that we tell. Here's why I say that. You'll notice on the graphic, in God's story, as we'll go through it, there's actually four chapters. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, or the renewal of all things. That day we're looking forward to kind of thing. But typically, the way most of us live our Christian lives nowadays is just chapters 2 and 3. Now, 3 is a long one. 2 happened like that and then ruined, you know, or at least defaced and damaged what was intended originally. But we tend to live between Genesis 3 and Revelation 20 when Satan and everything is all judged and dealt with. And then 21 and 22 of Revelation is getting back to it's re creation it's re it's consummation of here's what i was after and now god being with his people we will know him he will be glorified but we tend to live in this just two chapter this is all so therefore we think as christians if i'm gonna be a good christian it's really all about sin and solving the problem of sin now hear this before you roast me at the stake for being a heretic sin is a big problem sin needs to be dealt with redemption or to be bought back out of slavery is absolutely vital to what god is doing in the world now it's just not the whole story because you can't i just like i jumped into our passage today i jumped into day six well there's a few verses that are days one through five and so i'm submitting this here's why most of us live a, a either distressed or bored Christian lives because we don't know what to do from Sunday to Monday. Monday through Saturday is all about competition and conflict. Get ahead, put food on the table, or make enough money to support the missionaries who are doing the real work. We love missionaries, we support missionaries. What I want to blow out of the water is that idea, and we'll come back to it at the end, that it's not the missionaries and the pastors and the theology teachers are doing all the work, and we just kind of support that happening. That's not what God intended. That's not what we're going to see in the passage today, which happened before the fall. Before the fall. Let's go. We, what we need is a story that will repurpose us. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning... God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day, or one day. I'm not going to continue to read, but that rhythm that cadence goes through the genesis 1 account of creation and then it gets echoed and expressed with additional textures in genesis 2 our genesis 2 is kind of like the barbecue story of the aluma and uh, <laughs> enuma elish okay but here's what i want you to observe a couple of things is we want to see our passage in its context and so go to the next slide here two observations God does, um, first of all, there's order. Remember, Marduk was the demigod of order. 
God is a God of order. And what we see is the first three days is the, he creates order, structure, structure that could sustain what he will put in it. And so it says, uh, let there be. And it was so, and it was good. And part of how this structure um, gets worded here is often separation. He separates the heavens and the earth. He separates the waters from the earth. Like, he's separating, he's ordering, he's making appropriate places for what he wants to demonstrate his glory and his beauty and his power and all of who he is. And so he's a God of order. Some of you are like, yes, order, order, order. That's a good thing. That's a God thing. That's an image-bearing thing within you. But I want us to notice the second observation, days four through six, now that there is order and structure and separation and places, now the second observation is filling. He fills with vegetation. He fills the seas with, you know, sea creatures. He fills the sky, skies with birds. He fills the land with, with cattle and elk and wombats. He fills the earth with creatures, including then human beings. What I want you to observe is that God creates with order and he creates with this filling. But I want you to notice um, in a couple of different places that he uses the idea that not only did they fill it, they swarmed like verse 21. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. Uh, with which the waters swarmed after their kind. And then uh, he does it uh, again a couple other places, or some of your, your versions will say teeming, not T-E-A-M-I-N-G, -E but T-E-E-M-I-N-G. Teeming, overflowing, abundance. What does that show? God isn't a God who creates just the bare minimum. Um, I talked to my mom quite a bit. My mom, I thank the Lord for her extremely frugal. I told uh, my wife that someday we're going to find out she's like a trillionaire and it's all under her mattress because she never spent a dime. But I try to help my mom occasionally say, you realize that God is such a, a joyful, delighting creator and creates with such abundance that there are flowers in the rainforest in Brazil that no one's ever seen and no one ever beheld them. And we would think, well, what a waste. No, God's like, I'm just I'm just delighted. And he creates teeming creation to fill those structures. So what I want you to see is that God is a God of structure, and he creates with order and yet abundance, overflow, almost, you could say, unpredictability. Geese fly in a V, but also you can't really control those suckers. And if you're not real nice at Celebration Park, they might come after you. And God is a God of wild abundance, wild abundance. But many of us live like we serve Marduk. Many of us are subservient to our narrative in our day. Survival of the fittest, you're an accident. God says, let there be, and it was, and he filled, and there's abundance. He's a God of order and abundance, which you can call flourishing. He is after you and me being part of his creation, flourishing, co-creators, structuring for and working toward abundance and flourishing. So day six, he gets there in the next slide. He goes from, let there be, let there be. God created by speaking. And it was so, just like he said, and then he evaluated and he said, it's good, it's good, it's good. That's really, I mean, that's good. Sorry, I did not really. But the end of verse six, and we, we misconstrue this. We say, ah, when he got to humans, he said, humans are very good. No, he says when he surveyed all that he had done. What he's saying is when he has surveyed the order he put in place and the potential for flourishing, the potential for fruitfulness in this earth. It's very good. It's God's divine. 
chapter 2 picks that up. God actually says, well, on the seventh day, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to have a nice lawn chair and a beverage. Don't worry. And I'm going to take it in, and I'm going to say, it's very good. He intends for us to work, but not to work ourselves to the bone and never step back and go, okay, first of all, you provide, and, se- and abundance comes from your hand. But second of all, I'm also to remind myself weekly or in a rhythm that you are my sustainer, you are my provider, you are my creator, and I'm the cre- created, I'm the creature, and I'm utterly dependent on you. And therefore, we have a time. It's not just a time to sit back. It's a time to reflect, to worship, and to return to the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we get back to our passages, verses 26 to 28. And he says, Let's make, Let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So I want you to notice, let us, there's a plurality in the Godhead. There's a triunity. There's no word for trinity. I believe our women are studying that this fall. Um, Just the delight and the joy of knowing the triune God. But God is, and what, what, what we get here is a picture of, the beauty of the community of the trinity. And when he says, let us make man in our image, male and female, there's a diversity of persons in a community of self-giving love. No, 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 you, no, you, no, you, no, you. You're you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're loving. And lavish giving, artistic creation, purposeful creation, this is our God. And he says, let us make man or mankind in our image. And then when he gets to the end, he gives them the, what we, this is why I'm saying we have an incomplete story. If I say great commission, where is it? I know most of us are like, uh, Jeopardy, I don't, I won't have the answer. Matthew 28, 16 to 20, 19 to 20 is more concisely the, what we call the great commission. It's the second great commission. This is the first great commission. Before there was a fall, you are my image bearers. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill, subdue, and rule over my creation that I'm inviting you into to bring order and bring out of it the potentialities I put in it to be fruitful and overflowing and beautifying my name as the one whose image you bear. This has a lot of implications. I bring us back to my graphic of the full story, which we're not, I don't have to, other than just show it to you real quick, Will, William. We're in creation. Next week, we're going to talk about, well, yeah, we are to bear his image, but that image, next week, I'm going to give you the spoiler alert. It's the image was defaced, but not erased. But that gives us a big problem. So now image bearing becomes difficult. Now image bearing, like, well, I don't really want to bear the image. Or I'm kind of want to be my own image. That's the fall, redemption, and then we get back to consummation. And the redemption is about being renewed to the true image, Colossians 3. It's, it's a part of not only are we to bear the image, but we're to be part of God's movement of image bearers who restore the image in, of God wherever it has been tarnished and twisted. That's next week. And then you have eventually the renewed image that we all enjoy being with God forever, just as he intended. So I want to close with um, these three things. When I say close, I'll do it as quickly as I can. Next slide. Because I'm so glad Eric brought this up. He had no idea I had this quote. But I just want to ask for a second. Okay, we're supposed to be image bearers and be creating. Should we all become farmers like Jordan and Katie and have chickens and I don't know how much you're farming, but, you know, chicken. Or, you know, is that what we're supposed to do? Like, why gather for worship? Why gather to sing some songs and, and uh, to listen to me half-glazed and maybe work with our kid? Why? Well, number one, he is worthy. Number two, what matters most to him is that he matters most to us. 
but also it's to reorient us again and again, week by week, that you were made for a purpose, that you were made on purpose for a purpose, to be his image bearer, to bear the image of God. And this isn't just the calling of Christians. This is the calling of all human beings. So part of bearing his image is when we walk out of here and a person cuts us off in traffic or cheats us out of a tip if we're a a waiter, is how do I bear the image of God to my fellow image bearer who right now is getting on my last nerve or is wronging me, but they are made in the image of God so that I don't see someone less than me because of their socioeconomic status, because of the color of their skin, because of their political party. Why we gather and why it's so important to gather, and I would say even in person, is so that the word about Christ, who did redeem us and who is the true image, would be abundant and teeming amongst us so that we would be taught and reproved through what we sing, songs, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. So that then whatever we do in word or deed, which is also worship, we would do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Here's the quote, James Smith. Why is worship important? Worship that restores us, which sometimes you feel that, right? You sing all creatures of our God and King or on Christ the solid rock. And there's something that resonates in you. Why? Just like other origin stories, this is a reminder of who my God is and how gracious he has been in my life. And it restores me. It's a renewing of me in Christ. But he says, worship that restores us is worship that restores us. Some of you in here are in desperate need of being restoried. You're in desperate need to be told, not only are you not an accident, and God is a God of order and abundance, but he took time and intention to make you. The world isn't about you, but what a gracious and generous and kind God that he would make you with delight. And you may not feel like David says in Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but God wants you to be restored into that truth that his thoughts of you outnumber the sands, regardless of how mangled the mess of your life is. Because he's a God who can restore, can rescue, can repurpose. And if you're drifting, quit drifting. Allow him to waken you today. to make sense of your days through the story that he's trying to restore you and me to today and to make something of the world where you're fruitful and you're multiplying little glimpses of God's glory throughout this place and blessing of your neighbor for the common good and doing something where God goes, man, I'm going to put that on my wall, on my refrigerator, that little drawing you did of your life in this week. Some of us are in desperate need that God, who is the author and perfecter of your story, is seeking to restore restore you right now. A couple implications, restoring us. A few implications. I want you to notice in the text, we are created. We'll talk about this more next week and how we messed it up, the tragic exchange that we exchanged the image of you know, the creator for the creature. But we are created. You are made. God made you with intention, design, and purpose. And he's also said a primary purpose of your life is I didn't make the feline and the cow in my image. I made you, male and female, in my image. And so the second one is we are his image bearers. Kings back in those days would put statues or images of themselves all throughout their empire, big or small. So to the farthest extent, if you're into the Roman Empire, you'd see some Caesar stuff. Uh, If you're in the Babylonian Empire, they'd make sure you saw Nebuchadnezzar or you were reminded you're under my rule. I'm the big chief. I'm the one you should make a big deal about. 
and you better be fearful if you don't. Well, God doesn't have that bent on us, but he did bend you. He did make you with intention to bear his image everywhere. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Man, yeah, put a little order. Some of you type A's, I made you type A, B type A. And some of you type B's who are overflowers and teamers, help us do that too, so that my image echoes all throughout my creation. Because one day, the glory of the Lord will fully, finally, and consummatively, if that's a word, will fill the earth. But it's interesting that I think it's Habakkuk says, one day, it'll be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. We'll talk about that later. But we are his image bearers. And part of image bearing, it's not a solo act. God is not one God. He is one God, but he's not one person, kind of melded together. He's three persons in one triunity. And they said, let us make man in our image, male and female. He created them. And so to gather is not only for worship, it's to reflect his image to one another. And it's, we're to travel together and scatter together in fellowship, because Jesus said, if you have love for one another, they'll know you're mine. My image will be all over you by how you treat each other. It requires that self-giving love in the Trinity, shared delight and joy within community. And then he also, as his image bearers, he created you with capacity to make something good or something of God's good world, that order and abundance. And lastly, this is the first great commission you are commissioned and capacitated. Many of us live as if we are incapacitated. Wherever you have limits, those are God-given. Wherever you have part of your story, you're like, but you don't know the hurt. You don't know the misuse. You don't know the failure. God knows, and God wants to redeem. God wants to bring redemptive power, grace, and mercy so that we might be capacitated again and again. Unlike the animals, they were not commissioned and capacitated the way we are. We're made in his image. Part of what that means is we reflect God to the creation. We also reflect the creation back to God in praise, in lament, in tears. And he's given us acuity to make sense of the world. Not always. A lot of times we're foggy. But he said, I did put it in you. I put eternity in your hearts, but sometimes you don't know how to discover it. Sometimes we need each other to help discover it. He's also given us authority. Authority means the capacity to make something of the world. The gods of Marduk, etc. If you want to bear their image, then what you do is you use authority for your own good. You consume, you don't contribute. You don't bring flourishing and abundance. You discard, you use, and it's all about you. God says, I made you in my image. I'm a God of grace, of lavishness, of creativity, of artistry, of power. But that power is harnessed to, glorify, to bring me glory and to bring you good in my good, good world. So lastly, the charge to us is bear his image. Worship team, would you come up? This again is the first great commission. And this has an implication for work. When he says bear his image, when, it, when we are created and he says be fruitful and multiply, and in chapter two, he says, now I want you to cultivate and keep the garden. Work happened before the fall. We think of work often as something that needs to be avoided at all costs, like Marduk. Let me get some other minions to do this because life will really be found if I can just sit back, smell the aroma, and not do a squat. That's not bearing his image, which is why a lot of our lives feel empty. That's why after hours of scrolling, you feel empty because God didn't create me or you to be a voyeur to watch other people live. He created you to live how he designed you to live. So act, if we're going to bear his image to be fruitful, multiply, act in this world like the true image would act. Jesus is the true image of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. 
Glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. We'll talk more about that true image next week and what he did to take care of the fall and sin. But act in this world like the true image, like God himself would. And then I think of a story. It's the last illustration for us. Jesus is confronted by some folks who are trying to, you know, catch him. And they're like, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? You remember this. He says, well, give me a coin. He says, whose inscription or whose image is on this coin? They go, well, Caesar. And Jesus says, well, render to Caesar what's Caesar's, but render to God what is God's. My question is, if God made you and me in his image, then he's thrown coins everywhere which is me and you, with his image on it. But my question is, whose image are we bearing? And where he has intended for me to bear his image, am I bearing it faithfully, joyfully, generously? And then, really the challenge of Jesus there is not just render to Caesar, but render to God what is God's. What is God's is my own life. Therefore, we talk a lot here about whole life discipleship, not just Sunday. Our job as leaders of this church is to equip you, the saints, for the work of the ministry. The work of the church is usually the church at work. This past week, we got a, the roster sent to us as parents at Curtis Middle School football, and then 30 minutes later, they resent the roster. It was the roster was like, so you can know if your kid's playing at 5.30 or 7. But it was also which team is B, which plays earlier, and which team is A. When they resent it 30 minutes later, there's only one kid's name who was changed. Only our family and the family of that kid know. Nobody else paid attention to it. They're just looking for their kid. But you know what that communicated was? I got moved from A team to B team. Please, please, please hear the message. If you're made in God's image and work was before the fall, it's not the missionaries and pastors who are the A team. And if you think that and keep saying that, I'm going to call you a liar. Because <laughs> we, and what I want to say for us is we want to make up the gap. We want to help you make up that gap to where your capacity, God's already given you, you're growing your capacity to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in your workplace and your neighborhood. Would you stand? That's our benediction because Eric is going to help us sing a song which will resonate and echo with that theme. As you leave, bear his image so the world will know him. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God.